This is Generation Health. Every week we bring you news, cutting edge research, and time-tested best practices for living a long and healthy life. With the tools and information available today, this generation has the potential to be the healthiest in human history. Following in the footsteps of our founder, Joe DiMatteo, we are the second generation of a family dedicated to helping you live better and longer. With us, as always, Dante DiMatteo, registered pharmacist, certified strength and conditioning specialist. How are you, sir? Good, Tyler. How are you? Fantastic. Good. Joey DiMatteo, across from me, registered pharmacist and board certified clinical nutritionist. How are you? Very good. Excellent. Excellent. I am your host, Tyler Andrews. And today's show, we've got antibiotic resistance, exercising to live longer, lots of articles about that. I actually didn't even include all of the articles I found about that because in the last couple of months, anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Exercise to live longer. And if we have time, I have to share with you what I saw in the story of Judah. We'll get there if we can. But first, the most important thing, I know this is why you guys show up every day, mm -hmm. the unrelated questions. Did you cheat? Did and we you look don't ahead? get to prep for these. I don't, no. I don't look ahead. I don't look ahead okay. either. All right. All right. I think I actually know the answer to this one. What was your first job? Oh, mine. I loved my first job. Oh. It was a uh, blockbuster video. Oh, then it wasn't what I thought. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Blockbuster video. Um, I was 16. Yeah. Supposed to be 17. They snuck me in. It's 16. And um, I got five free rentals, games, or movies a week. And I love movies and love games. So. They limited you to five a week? Free ones. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, for free, we well, thought sure, that but... was you know amazing. So I think I made, it was minimum wage. I think I made 5.15 an hour, then I got wow. up to 5.35. Nice. Yeah. Climbing the rungs. Yes. And <laughs> then uh, I, I kept the job even like just working on like Sunday afternoon so I could get the five free rentals. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So actually, yeah, fond memories of my first job, Blockbuster Video, for sure, I'm in Roeville. That's amazing. I remember going to visit you there. That was the best. Well, that had to be cool. Like, oh. to have a... Like, yeah, my brother works at Blockbuster. <laughs> like, let's go. We got to go get the Sour Patch Kids. The my, my brother's in the movie industry. <laughs> twisted Metal, you know, yeah. all the games. Oh, I, Twisted Metal. I didn't have the game. power to um, waive late fees, though, unfortunately. And that's, that's, that's why it went down. Yeah. That's why it went down. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about that. My kids can already hear the lecture. I used to lecture about the reason Blockbuster Video went belly up. And anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> this is stupid. I miss it. Dante? Uh, well, since I was the youngest of three, I was allowed to work at the pharmacy first, I guess, technically. <laughs> um, I don't even know what I did there. Yeah. My dad just let me kind of roll up once I got my license, did some deliveries, yeah. not, not as much, but like take a deposit, count some stuff, you know, <laughs> the very basics. But my, no, my first non-pharmacy job and my only other non-pharmacy job was uh, umpiring, baseball. Oh, umpiring. Right. Yeah. So that was fun. That was like an entire summer, but yeah, very yeah, cool. That was wild. All right. Did you get yelled at? Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, that I was, can't imagine. I mean, there was, there was games where like you'd be at a big sports complex. I would be at a field and then the fields nearby, like all my friends would be at umpiring. Yeah, yeah. And I could hear like, you know, the fans and the parents yelling at my friends at the other field. And <laughs> next thing you know, they're tossing fans, tossing coaches. Wow. And it was like, ah, uh, yeah. Fond memories of that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. You had the power to throw people out, huh? Yeah, yeah, seriously. Fortunately, I never had to, but it felt like, a couple of, couple of my friends, they did all the time, like wow. once a tournament. So maybe that speaks to like the type of people that were out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's more on the ump. I won't drop band. any. I won't drop any names, but I, I think they call amazing. that corporal syndrome, where you get a little bit of power and so yeah. you abuse it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was my first job. I cut the grass for my church. It had twenty something acres of backyard, and so that's what I did, and it was awful. Wow. Riding mower. It was. It was still. a riding lawnmower, but I mean, it was still, still a lot of grass. And yes. it was in the middle of a drought. And I had uh, mono that summer, but didn't know it. And so everybody kept calling me lazy and I just could not stay away. Like it was bad. Anyway, that's wow. done. So, okay, now <laughs> I have a part B to this. What was your worst job? Dante, you don't have to answer since you've only had <laughs> pharmacy jobs. <laughs> yeah, honestly... Oh yeah, for a little while I um, dried cars. You dried family, cars. Family, family uh, friend 
owned a um, car wash. Okay. So I, for like one summer, of like a couple days a week in between, because I would deliver, be a delivery driver for um, the pharmacy. Sure. So to kind of fill in um, the other days where I wasn't needed, because we obviously wanted to keep, you know, the guys that were there still getting the hours they wanted, I would um, dry cars. So they come through the line, middle of summer, it's packed nonstop, and I would get to dry the cars. That sounds awful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, oh, I've never had a bad one. It's only been the pharmacy blockbuster, and I delivered for Fox's Pizza, but no, that was that was it. That was short lived. <laughs> I thought it would be cool to work at a library because I loved reading, uh, and so I got a job at the library. And um, aside from not being a details person, which I'm not, uh, it turns out shelving. This is I'm going to offend somebody, and I don't mean to, but shelving um, large print romance novels for six hours straight, that smell of perfume <laughs> was pretty much the worst thing I could imagine. It was, it was <laughs> those awful. Were the, those were the fast movers at your library? It lasted, I, I lasted two days before I just <laughs> was like, okay, this is, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> wow. I was pretty sure I was putting them in the wrong places too. Not on purpose, but just genuinely. Wow. I mean, you guys know me, I can't do that. That's a terrible <laughs> job. All right, let's get into the important things here. <laughs> Uh, we got an email question from Dr. Cook. Uh, the, the doctor says, I'd love to hear your thoughts as pharmacists on antibiotic stewardship. I see an enormous number of upper respiratory infections, almost all of them viral. When do you genu generally recommend antibiotics versus over-the-counter treatment? Yeah, so um, he's a physician, so he's you know, saying that he sees, you know, mostly viral. So, um, you know, from our end, you know, we're not prescribers. We get a little bit, we get the other end. We get people coming in um, and saying things like, hey, you know, is there a refill on my antibiotic? I yeah. feel just the way I felt last year or two years ago when Dr. Cook wrote me this antibiotic prescription. So we get that end. So I would say our role more so than when do we, you know, recommend antibiotics, so to say, just because we're pharmacists, not prescribers. We get a free pass. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, we kind of get to not so much give like the, um, you know, antibiotic uh, stewardship um, speech or anything, but we kind of do tell people, well, you, we have to make sure that it's um, bacterial, not viral. How long have your symptoms gone? Do you have a fever? Those kind of things. So we will end up talking to them about, about that. Um, I think it's a big thing that physicians, they get a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, constant pressure from patients. You know, um, why do you have to see me? You, it's it's the same thing as last year. Or to us, they say they just want their they just want the copay. They yeah, just want right. me to come in. You know those kind of things. So you know from our end, yeah, we end up we do end up speaking a lot about that antimicrobial stewardship type thing where resistance is an issue. Those kind of things you want to make sure it's actually bacterial. So where I usually jump in is then I'll let you go ahead, but is what you can do for symptoms. Yeah. That's where we say, hey, this is where we can actually help besides our little spiel about you okay, know, so, is it viral or bacterial. So it sounds like there's a bigger question here. It's not yeah. just when do you recommend uh, that. So what is the bigger question? The bigger question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that um, we, maybe this isn't exactly where you're going, but our role seems as though kind of like Joey alluded to is that we're there as sort of the last line of defense is almost like as, you know, for education purposes. Mm -hmm. So when somebody ends up asking us about the antibiotics, it's more, it's, it's more our job to say, Hey, you may not understand all the, you know, the minutia of this, but this is why your doctor may not want to write the antibiotic. This is why they're not jumping to the antiviral. This is why, you know, they don't want to treat you, you know, if they haven't seen you or done cultures or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's probably not your or question. Or maybe why they won't say. call you back for a week because they, yeah. they want to see if it's 10, 14 days, not right. four or five, six days. You know, okay. that's one of the yeah, criteria. Well, the qu I mean, you said antibiotic resistance, and I know that's something we've, mm -hmm. I've seen articles about all the time. I guess one of the first questions is an antibiotic specifically is for 
bacteria, not viruses? Exactly, it only works on bacteria. Okay, so if you have a viral infection, there's no point in having an antibiotic because it's not gonna do anything. No, mm -hmm. okay. all it's gonna do is alter your body's um, existing flora and we can, unless you've got some you know, underlying- Right, you something know, else going therapeutic on. Infection, yeah, then, then yeah, that's all it's gonna do is, is actually be a negative. Okay. And uh, we, we'll get into this, but globally, when that happens on large scales, then that's when you get into antibiotic resistance in general populations or in pockets of, of populations. Okay, so what is that? So what is antibiotic resistance? What are we talking about? Um, and the most simple way to put it is that bacteria learn to survive and evade antibiotics. That's, okay. I mean, Dante may have a more technical definition than that, but <laughs> that's basically the bacteria are learning. They learn through mutations right. um, to survive and evade antibiotics. Okay. They're just, they're out there just trying to survive and their genes mutate purely based on how can they survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so then how it manifests is that, you know, antibiotics that typically work stop working. Right. And so then you have these infections and such that were that are commonly treated, you know, fairly effectively and, and promptly now they delay longer and we can't use certain combinations of antibiotics. It just it leads to a whole cascade of issue. I in in looking up stuff for this, I found a couple of really interesting articles uh, talking about this very thing. This is from The Death of a Wonder Drug by Aaliyah Hardy um, and uh, from The Telegraph. It says, more and more infections such as E. coli, MRSA, and sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea are becoming even harder to vanquish with standard antibiotics. Antibi antibacterial resistance is already killing almost 5 million people a year globally, and unless we manage to slow it down and find new drugs to tackle infection, health experts warn that the death toll could climb as high as 10 million by 2050. Before antibiotics, this is a really relevant question, before antibiotics, 43% of people died of infections in this country. So meaning, I assume that means if you got an infection, you had a 43% chance of dying from it. That seems awful. Mm -hmm. uh, today, it is 7%. They make surgery and cancer treatment oh, much God. safer. But we know that these medications are too often used for illnesses caused by viruses. That's what we were talking about, okay, which are impervious to antibiotics or for minor infections that would clear up on their own. Global antibiotic consumption rates increased by 46% from 2000 to 2018. Oh my, I didn't realize that. According to a study published by the wow. journal Lancet, um, that's those are pretty stark That's numbers. That's surprising that that, you know, late in the game, so to say, that 2000 to 2018, that there was a 46% increase. That's, that's pretty significant. <laughs> Certainly some of that can be accounted for with um, more availability in places like third world countries, right? I mean, that's not strictly US consumption of- That's of a good point when they yeah, say global. Those sort of things, sort yes. of things. Yeah, that is a very good point. But even so- Yeah, the point is, the greater point is that they're just, they're being used yeah, yeah. a ton mm -hmm. and not and, always for the wrong reasons. And in many countries over the yeah. counter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then wow. with the, with the internet, now you have the ability to access the countries who allow over the counter antibiotics. You can get them over the counter in different places. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't do that. That's a really bad idea. If it's yeah. not a bacterial infection, it's not going to help you. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So how does, so how is it that this, this is happening? You said it's, the the bacteria are mutating. Yes, that's de that's definitely one large component of it. And so the the genetic factor, you know, how how genes actually mutate and then how they're transferred is a probably would serve as an episode in and of, in and of itself. Sure. Yeah. But yes, at the at the very at the most basic level, that's what's occurring. So each antibiotic works in a different way. So. You know, not 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 to be crude, but of course it's not. You know, like this antibiotic goes in there with a big knife and stabs a bacteria. I mean, right. it's working in some fancy microbiological way. And for example, one of those ways is that the cell wall. Um, so so this bacteria has the ability to break down the cell wall, hmm. um, or it has the ability ability to interfere with DNA replication so that it can't replicate and it dies off that way. Of healthy cells. Yes. Okay. So what the, what the bacteria does is over time it realizes, hey, when this substance is attaching 
at this protein on my cell wall, it's breaking my cell wall apart. Oh. Okay. And then it so it starts to genes start to be, be passed and mutated that that don't allow it to attach to that's just one little crude way of describing it. Right. But that will say, okay, you know, we're not gonna this protein now, we're gonna change the way its surface looks. So this antibiotic can't attach to it. Things mm. like that. So that so the, the, each one is is a specific mechanism. And the, I don't want to go too deep into this either, but that's why people talk about this is this a strong we always get asked, is this a strong antibiotic? Is this a weak one? Yeah. It's it's really it's it's the way they work is what do they work on? Are they broad antibiotics that can work on whole lots of things, a whole bunch of different things, or are they narrow that can they only work, you know, because it can only attach to this type of cell wall or only attach to this type of DNA um, okay. that they work on very specific bacteria. Okay, so that's why the whole strong versus weak thing is it, mm -hmm. it's not a, doesn't really apply, right? Uh, okay, well there, that makes sense. Yeah, there is there is maybe one small thing to add to that just sort of reminds me, and I'm sure you'll get to this in some capacity, but the choice, you know, choosing the, you know, when a, when a clinician has to choose the right antibiotic, narrow versus broad is such a huge part of this. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, from the stewardship perspective, clinicians are trying to work towards trying to find the most narrow form of therapy for a given infection, because if you keep throwing the same broad spectrums at a multitude of different infections, then that's what sort of leads to this whole recognition and, and resistance path, pathway that occurs. So, so finding the specific agent makes more sense than just saying, yeah, we'll just use a ZPAC. Yeah, we'll just mm -hmm. use clindamycin. That takes time, that takes yeah. appointments, that right. takes, mm -hmm. who wants to do that, you know, from a patient standpoint? It seems like to some extent, this is an inevitable problem that eventually, even if we're all perfect stewards of our antibiotics, a thousand years from now, mm -hmm. the bacteria will have mutated to the mm -hmm. point that they can resist a Z pack. It's about right. the pace, the right. pace of it. And We're accelerated, accelerated the pace, but yes, yes, you're correct. And that's the thing. The concern is that this is happening so quickly that, I mean, if we've increased consumption by 46% in 18 years, that's a lot. Yep. And so if I'm remembering my high school biology correctly, any sort of evolutionary action like this, the more opportunities, the more chances for mutation, the more it's going to succeed mm -hmm. eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and fascinating. And Go ahead. When, when you mentioned, um, when you mentioned the, you know, sort of like the historical perspective. Yeah. You know, there was, you know, or maybe like the early 1900s, there was maybe like the 1900s to the 1960s or whatever it was, there was a massive increase in the development of antibiotics. Well, now that has drastically decreased. So in addition to re resistance increasing, there's a decrease in the actual production and research of antibiotics. And so is, it does that does pose an interesting Does that come challenge. down to what I'm gonna guess it comes down to? <laughs> Definitely plays a role. The bottom dollar? Mm -hmm. okay. Definitely, because you have to think, and that's a great point, because you have to think about um, if you make a medication for diabetes, um, that, that person's gonna be on that medication, God willing, monthly, for years, decades, right? Um, even cancer, you're talking months and months, and you're talking about medications that are in the five figures of money. Yeah, um, cholesterol drugs monthly for decades. Antibiotics, if they're if they're good, you're taking them for seven to ten days. Yeah, then they're done. They're not big money makers. And further, um, they they're tip, they typically are um, derived from natural products, and so it's becoming harder and harder to find what those find more of those natural products to derive them from. Wow. But overall, yes, it, it's money is the main thing and it's just not as uh, not as profitable overall. Okay, mm -hmm. so I did some I did some research cuz I can do that and I wanted to learn all about the history of antibiotics cuz I didn't know exactly how it came to be. Um, first of all, the Greek root literally means opposing life, which when I went anti Bio. Bio. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess that is what that means. That's fascinating. Uh, documented uses in ancient Egypt, Nubia, China, Serbia, Greece, and Rome in the form of moldy bread applied directly to wounds. Wow. We've come a long way. 
Uh, but you know, if you're bored, feel free to put some. How about the bloodletting and the leeches and the mercury? Yeah, the, oh. thankfully that's not related to this. Um, <laughs> so penicillin, penicillin was discovered in 1928 by Scottish physician Sir Alexander Fleming. Um, he purified the compound version penicillin F. Excuse me, no, he didn't. Uh, two more doctors named Flory and Chain in Oxford, who eventually worked with him in 1940. Penicillin F is the one that um, we all use, correct? Penicillin G. G. Maybe C F G. Oh, so one that came after. Okay. Um, and then Pen VK. Pen VK. Pen VK. What is that? And penicillin G are used. They have just little tweaks on the penicillin. Yeah, okay. Pen VK is the one that you're gonna see. Mm -hmm. Pen V. Penicillin yeah. V is the one you're going to see, and the, the K is really potassium, but the one that you're going to see, like if it's prescribed from a dental office or something, you don't see a whole lot of penicillin. And then penicillin G is used for specific um, like STDs, I, I believe. Yeah, intramuscularly, intravenous, yeah. intravenously, yes. Yes, yeah, syphilis. Yeah, so. Dr. Fleming used that form to treat streptococcal meningitis in 1942 hmm. uh, for the first time successfully, and then the three of them shared the Nobel Prize in 1945 for physiology and medicine, which, you know... <laughs> that makes sense. If yeah. you discover penicillin, you get to have a Nobel Prize. And I see in the 50s that Fleming was already warning of um, resistance. Really? Mm -hmm. So they figured out, I mean, they knew right away knew this is not a 50s, good idea. He started use in the 40s. And by the 50s, he um, shortly thereafter, he became aware of a substantial clinical problem. So I, I found in one, I guess it was in the, the, the emergency room, um, it was a book about how to be in an ER doctor or something like that. And it said the first rule of antibiotics is to try not to use them. And the second rule is to try not to use too many of them. <laughs> uh, so yeah. all of it comes back to this notion of antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think one thing I want to make sure we don't miss because it's huge. Um, agriculture. Okay. Is, is antibiotics used um, not because an animal gets sick, not because you've got, you know... Um, um, you know, this, the, your, your stable of, of cows or whatever the, the correct term would be. And one of them gets sick. That's humane. You right. treat the cow. Yeah. We're talking about prophylactic use. Um, an estimated 80% of the antibiotics sold in the U S are for livestock. No mm. kidding. That's to promote growth and prevent infection. Wow. So, cause it's documented antibiotic treated livestock produce larger yields, higher quality product. So that's why, you know, and they're not a part of the stewardship, you know, and right. when, you're, when you're looking at hospital organizations and insurances and phys physician groups and pharmacies, even you, you're talking about, I don't know, one, one industry with its different parts. Then you start throwing in, you know, Tyson and Cargill and Cisco and Purdue. Yeah. You're trying to get them involved yeah. to, you know, they, they don't want, um, you know, smaller yield. So that's why whenever you see, um, you know, non-treated it's usually it usually comes along with hormones usually you're going to see yep. non-hormone um treated dairy meats or meats okay and non and non and non-antibiotic you usually see those together that's why but hey that's why they are more money they're going to have smaller yields and wow. it's not these mega companies etc so but that sounds like that's that's a really important thing like we need huge. to yeah figure out not just because it's better to eat meat or uh, drink dairy from a non-antibiotic filled animal, but because it's literally going to threaten all of human civilization potentially, or at least take us back a, a century in yeah. terms of survivability of basic infections. Definitely, and not to like go off on a tangent, but it does show like how complicated diet it can be. Yeah. I mean, because you, of course your steps are you wanna, you wanna individually be healthy and eat right and the, you know, get your macros and your, and your micros and your nutrients and you wanna be of good weight, et cetera. But then what if you're just, you know, funneling into your body poor quality meats that are pumped full of antibiotics and hormones. And right. you're using tons of artificial sweeteners to keep calories down. Like there are so many different um, avenues about what makes up health. And yeah. each individual has to prioritize those. Right. You right. know what I mean? You, you, you've got to. It's, it's, it can be difficult. Um, but, you know, it made me think of that as well. Like that tangent when we think about food, you're always about health and weight and right. blood sugar levels and all those things. So. So yeah, we, it's documented that um, there's transfer of resistant bacteria from animals to humans via the meat consumption. So, okay, so this is 
fascinating and interesting, but aside from diet and, and trying not to eat too much meat in that sense, um, what are some practical things that I and my family need to be doing to try and um, reduce the risk of uh, a super bug that kills everybody? Yeah. Yeah, I think we, we have a handful of recommendations that we can make. Um, there was one point I didn't want to gloss over. Please. And that was the, you know, as far as what you can do. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned that, you know, Joey mentioned, oh, I do I have a refill on this antibiotic that I had last year? Um, you know what? My sister, she has a Z-Pack left over that she never took, and I'm starting mm -hmm. to feel something come on. Or, you know, I had I had an appointment with my doctor, and they wanted me to ride this out. They wanted me to use some stuff for symptom relief. But now I'm PO'd and I'm going to the Med Express and I'm demanding that we get yeah. something treated here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's tough. And so what impact can we make as pharmacists or what impact can you make in your home? Um, as small as it may seem, I, I would really try to avoid taking the Z-Pack that's laying around. You know, if somebody finishes out an antibiotic for, uh, or, you know, or if they have five pills left over right. from their cephalexin on their, you know, skin and soft tissue infection, when when you think you're about done or they told you to stop, just throw it away because you, you know, at some point you're going to feel tempted to say, well, this, yeah. might, this might help. Yeah. 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 And look, we all think with Google and such, we're clinicians and we, we have the <laughs> answers and, th and this, even though this might work and this, you know, antibiotic might be, uh, this bacteria might be susceptible to the antibiotic that's in my cupboard. Try not to use it because there's going to be a time and a place where you actually need it and it may not work as well. Yeah. It might be a generation down, but right. it's still, that's still the practical yeah, thing definitely. you can do. There's always that little feeling that, you know, people say or that creeps in like, well, yeah, it's just me. I'm not contributing to antibiotics. <laughs> right. It's just me with this right. one little cold that I can't shake. I have this meeting tomorrow. It's, I know it's only day eight and my doctor said, you know, he'll talk to me in 10, 14 days. But, you know, that kind of thing too. It's, it's, it's just me. It's just this one little thing. And that's technically true, but that's that's where it all kind of starts. You right. Know? You could so be that's patient a huge zero thing. for the super bug that kills everybody. <laughs> but no, I mean, I mean, yeah, we don't want to hype it up too much. But yeah, yeah. those are all, all little decisions that add up in your own life, which then add up, obviously. It, 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 and, yes, and even to the, you know, even to the general population, let, or let's just say non-pharmacists, that's the spirit ultimately of why we're saying what we say. Yeah. What, what's the big deal? I'm just gonna take, you know, my five-day Z-Pack, who cares? Well, take, yeah. take a step back. One, it could be viral. Two, you're gonna need it at some point, and it's probably not right now. Did you get a sputum culture? No. Did you have blood work done? No. Did you have a chest x-ray done? Probably not. Unless all of those sorts of things are met, pump the brakes, somebody will test for it. You can get a flu swab, you can get a COVID test, whatever the case is, just just use a little discernment and wait a second, that's all. Okay, so mm -hmm. somebody in my family is feeling sick, we've got the cough, we've got the sniffles or what have you, and I don't wanna start them on antibiotics because I don't wanna contribute to the problem, what do I need to do? Yeah, I think for me, uh, and all pharmacists have their own little tweaks on things, um, I try to make sure that patients don't get too wrapped up in like the combo products and like the Advil cold and sinuses and, and those big fancy names. Okay. Um, and if you could just learn a few basic chemical names, okay. I know that's not, that doesn't sound like the real fun part, but just <laughs> a few basic ones that are in all those drugs and are alone in your cabinet. And just the, the ones that are gonna be used for fever, if you've got a little fever, um, acetaminophen mm -hmm. and ibuprofen, which are Tylenol and Advil. Those are brand names, but at least they're singular. Yep. Okay, those are the ones that, that are gonna be used for fever. Um, if your nose is stuffed up, not runny, stuffed, Sudafed or pseudoephedrine. Okay. Um, the key thing is remember it's pseudoephedrine. That's the one that's behind the counter. Um, be very careful with it. Elderly, be very careful with it if you've got a history of high, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. but a couple day course for somebody who's got a really stuffed up nose, really hurting, it's preventing them from sleeping, they've got a meeting, a speech, blah, blah, blah. I think that it is, it is okay for the average healthy adult. Don't let the behind the counter scare you in that sense. Mm -hmm. Let the facts scare you. It's behind the counter because it's a drug precursor. Right. Okay. The facts are as long as your blood pressure, um, you know, you don't have a history of high blood pressure. And even if it's controlled and your overall, you know, um, 
a healthy, healthy adult, there's really nothing wrong with doing that. Okay? And you can always talk to a pharmacist or talk to yes. your doctor to confirm yeah. that you're okay to take pseudoephedrine. Yes, exactly. Okay. And again, the key word to remember is the pseudoephedrine part. Um, runny nose, you change gears. Um, this is not so much the stuffiness, it's the runny. Um, antihistamines, um, Benadryl is gonna work the best, but it's also going to make you drowsy in yeah. the vast majority of cases. So that could be one you use at night if you'd like um, to help you know, use the side effect as a positive. Um, be careful with that in the elderly. Um, there's short-term and longer-term cognitive issues. Um, it, it's, it can make you a little, elderly can be, get a little confused even just from taking it short-term, let alone they have seen, you know, if they're taking it nightly. Oh, wow. Um, and this is where, and not to go off on this, but where the whole brand name thing gets a little tricky. Yeah. Because there are, you know, Tylenol PMs and there are um, uh, just different dr drug products that they're just Benadryl. Yeah. Re relabeled as like, you know, Tylenol PM or Aleve PM, or there's one that's just called, um, that has like Z's, it's just like yeah. Z something. And this, all it is is Benadryl. So that's why I think it's so critical. If you are gonna pull these medications off the shelf to either talk to a pharmacist while you're there or to know, again, not trying to make it too scientific here, it's a handful of them, know these chemical names. So is acetaminophen. Acetaminophen. Ibuprofen, pseudoephedrine. And Benadryl. Yes, and then there's a few more. The, 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 the antihistamine class, you're gonna have the old one, which is Benadryl. Then you kick over into like the Zyrtex and Claritins. Those are non-drowsies. Okay. okay. Okay, and again, they're, they're alone. Um, the, you, knowing the brand names of those is okay, because again, they're sing singular. So you got Cetirazine and Zyrtec. You've got that whole family. They're like second generation. So you know the antihistamines. And then lastly, it's cough stuff. I mean, yeah. you're really dealing with fevers, nose, you differentiate between stuffy and runny, and then cough. Um, mucinex, Robitussin is guaifenesin. The term you wanna know is guaifenesin. Okay. That's the one that um, is an expectorant. So it basically means it doesn't make you stop coughing. It just helps to thin the mucus out a little bit, helps to make it a little more productive. Got it, the other it end, out. The other end of the cough is the DM or the dextromethorphan. That's the suppressant. Okay, okay. Okay, so I know I know through a lot there, but the cough again, guaifenesin and dextromethorphan are your two big terms. Guaifenesin is gonna help thin out the mucus. You wanna drink a lot of water with that. That's really gonna make it help work better. And then the dextromethorphan part is the cough suppressant. That's maybe one you take at night. At night, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you don't wanna lose your quality of sleep. You do wanna watch it if your cough is productive. If you are, you know, getting rid of mucus, yep. you know, you don't wanna be suppressing that. So again, that's why sometimes it's good to have these products individual and to understand what these do. I know my list has grown a little bit. No, no, but good. There's a couple in the cough, there's a couple in the nose, and then there's the, the two in the fever. Yeah. And those are really from a drug point standpoint, what I stick with, I'm sure Dante has some other thoughts. The, the one thing I would wanna say not to do whenever it's cold and sinus is the steroid nasal sprays. They're steroids, if you have true allergies, and you're using them locally in the nose, nothing wrong with doing that in my opinion, but you wanna make sure just cause it says, you know, for the nose that you're not spraying steroids in your nose, it's not gonna do anything. If, if anything, it can hurt. Really, um, okay. If you've got an actual sickness, um, oh, virus okay. or bacteria and you're spraying a steroid up there. So you're saying normally when you're healthy, it's fine to use it, but if you're sick, stop and, and Address Basically, it with other things. Basically, only use steroid nasal sprays, no matter what the box says, for allergies. Got it. They're not going to help for because again, they're they're marketing. Yep. They're going to say things yep. about symptoms, and you may you may have this cold, this manifesting as a runny nose, and you may grab you know Flonase, and that's really not. You'd rather do an antihistamine, got it, um, than do something like a steroid. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that is very helpful. Um, are there any? What can I do in terms of prevention? I don't want to get sick in the first place. I don't want to get a virus. Mm -hmm. What can I do to boost my immune system? What can I do to help my family boost their immune system? Yeah, I mean, this obviously could go also in a hundred directions mm -hmm. as well. I think if you if you look at the overarching antimicrobial stewardship recommendations, you know, at, at hospitals yeah. or in retail or even just kind of how you know all the different fields are blended and what they're suggesting, immunizations are big. So we've talked about that on prior episodes, flu shots, COVID shots, you know, politics aside, all of, all of those sorts of things will hopefully reduce sort of the burden on different healthcare systems. Yep. So the less people that end up in the hospital, the 
less invasive treatments that are needed for those sick patients who often may have just may have prevented with something non-bacterial mm -hmm. but once they're in there they're on a ventilator they're on ecmo and they're wow. on antibiotics you know so it so that's the point you want to keep people out of the hospital prevention in that respect is where obviously immunizations come in you know if you're looking also at hospitals and even schools and in places of work hand hygiene is huge make sure that obviously you're washing your hands your kids are washing their hands right very basic and then there are some other specific um antibiotic issues and um sicknesses that can arise from being on antibiotics that for too long for example sure, sure, sure. c diff um, oh. and so they'll often recommend isolation precautions and such for you know for those situations so immunization hand hygiene isolation precaution sleep very Definitely. you know we this could be spun again back to various lifestyle things yep. but specifically looking at the stewardship part of it so it seems the like basics. there's a reason that certain people just don't get sick very often and it's because they're doing some of these fundamentals these basics obviously nobody can prevent all mm -hmm. viruses or, or bacterial infection sometimes you just get sick but yep. if you're doing the basics if you're eating clean if you're getting your vitamins and minerals if you are sleeping properly yes um and if we encourage at the pharmacy level if we encourage people to manage their symptoms that might prevent them from saying hey give me i need this antibiotic right. i, need, I yeah. need an answer now exactly so that's Very why well it's, so that's why it's yes. so important we we we're emphasizing symptom relief for a reason yeah so they don't end up taking the maybe the extra step that they don't need and and obviously when you're managing symptoms you're not really promoting any healing either. It's right. just to to kind of let the thing self-limit. And that's often mm -hmm. what happens. Not every time, you know, somebody might have chronic issues, chronic lung issues, bronchitis, whatever. The point is just to hopefully let these things self-limit over time. Yes, if it's not gonna end up needing an antibiotic, let's do what we can to make sure that you, whatever, however you wanna yeah. frame it, that you're not pushing your doctor into it or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be and, the, and still improving quality of life. So yeah, I think Dante said that perfectly. That's why, um, you know, I know we obviously talk about a lot of natural health on this show and it's like you guys just spent, you know, 10 minutes talking about, uh, you know, these medications, but that's why. Yeah. Because again, we are speaking to um, a direct question that's that's about mm -hmm. um, you know antibiotic use, so that's part of it. But on the other hand, the the, the, the drugs I'm mentioning here are pretty mild in in yeah, small yeah. uses. I mean, Tylenol and ibuprofen, or acetaminophen and ibuprofen. You take those long term; those are a problem. Yeah. Um, you know, liver for Tylenol to keep it short, and for ibuprofen, kidneys um, and cardiovascular. So, I'm not saying these things are just that they're candy, but when used right. properly, what when used you know, acutely when you've got something going on, they, they in my opinion, they are okay. Yeah. Um, there are certainly some supplements you can do. Um, in the winter, it's not a bad idea to at least get on a basic regimen if you're not on one all year. Um, vitamin C, D, probiotics, those are the basics. Okay. Um, you can increase those whenever you do get sick. Um, you can add in things like vitamin A and zinc. Um, also, when you do get sick, Herb wise, um, we still kind of mainly stick to the basics, but there are a few good herbs that we know of. Um, we've got one kind of combined, we call it Virostat, elderberry, um, andrographis, astragalus, echinacea, all in one. That's one you kind of hit whenever you get sick. You kind of leave it in the medicine cabinet all year. Hopefully you don't need it, hopefully it expires. Yep, but if you need yep. it, you take, two, you take two every couple hours for a day or two, then you can back down to like one or two a day. Um, if you really want to stay in the, um, you know, in the more herbal realm, beta glucan has okay. been shown to increase uh, neutrophil activity. Um, that's one that's more on the maintenance side. You could take one of those a day, maybe throughout the winter, um, or if you've if you've got some other issues going on, maybe immunocompromised, etc. So there are some other things you can do. Um, you know, besides the basics, besides symptom management, if you do get sick, to maybe, you know, keep it from a natural standpoint, um, you know, to, to give you some relief or maybe keep some things at bay. And supplement wise, those are primarily just designed to give your body what it needs to fight off whatever that issue is that's yes. not taking care of symptoms. That's where you need 
uh, over the counter medications yeah. like ibuprofen and 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 all the others that you and mentioned. And that's where I mean, if you're really sick, where we like both. Yeah, you know what I mean. There's nothing wrong with a blending of these two worlds, so to say. Cool. And if you're not all that sick, then you just hit the supplements or whatever you want to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? If it's just boy, I just can't stand at night that my nose is stuffed up. Well, you know what I mean. You do. You can do a little Sudafed if it doesn't keep you up, or you or you can do a little Benadryl yeah. just to try to clear you up a little bit. I mean, those are things that you know you can blend without feeling like you've got to live in on, one world walk. or the other. Exactly. Makes sense. Well, if anybody needs any of those supplements, we do have them available at our website, www.askjoedematteo.com. Uh, they are all available there. All the right. other thing I want to mention too quickly yeah. is the um, Clorox wipes, especially post-COVID. Um, the um, like triclosan, um, that's, that's been banned um, in certain things, but still is out there in certain products. But even your Clorox wipes, um, your antimicrobial soaps, just watch those, especially in kids. They are everywhere now. Um, basically what, what can happen with those is they work so, so well and they eradicate everything, viruses, bacteria, that it doesn't really allow your body's um, innate immune system to work on some of those basic bugs. Okay. Um, you know, I know in schools, you know, I have little kids in school, I know that they're everywhere, but so I make sure in the home, um, you know, I'm not wiping down my basic table with Clorox wipes. Like those things um, can be, it can be a little counterintuitive because you say, if it kills, Ninety nine point nine percent of bacteria. Why don't I want them just like sprayed all over my house? So that's why you still need some, especially in kids. Yeah. Some there's a balance, but some natural immunity because bugs are continuously mutating, are continuously changing. You're taking this hammer to every little bug that's in your house. Yeah. And it can be an issue longer term, you know, or, you, or you pick your spots where you use them. Yeah. You yeah. Know? When somebody is actually yeah. sick and you don't want to spread that right. to everybody else. Stick Let's on wipe the, down yeah, their wipe stuff. Yeah, wipe down microphone if I'm sick, maybe a toilet, but you don't, you don't do it after every meal on the right, table. Right. So I just thought that was something too in terms of what we can do, yeah. um, you know, in terms of antibiotic resistance. The other thing, and you always hear from, you know, the pharmacist or the doctor and say, yeah, yeah, but I feel better, is to finish the antibiotic. Um, when you don't finish the antibiotic, there is a chance that what you've done is left a... Um, an amount, well, just to keep layman's terms, you've left an amount of bacteria alive that's not maybe causing illness or symptoms like it was before, right. but that is still there yeah. and that slowly can work its way back up and replicate and multiply to get you sick again. Mm -hmm. That's A. Part B, um, it, it, it does provide, they found that it does kind of provide a breeding ground for the resistance because it doesn't eradicate the entire population, that it's it's still allowing us, it's in a, in a greater sense, allowing a survival of the fittest, so to right, say, yeah, because yeah. it's not taking care of, a, of as much of a higher percentage of them. That makes sense. Okay, that then that, that also, and then you don't have it sitting in your cabinet tempting yeah, you to that use too. it. That mm. too, yes. The, dur that, the duration part of it, finishing out the antibiotic, it really is critical. It's almost like you just have to trust that that five day, that that seven day, the 14 day, whatever it is, was incredibly well researched. Mm -hmm. It's it's not thirty four days for right, for right, a reason because right, right. they're and and just from the you know the health cl care clinician end, they're looking at minimizing these durations as much as possible yeah. as it is. Yes. So if you're so if you're on day three and you got to take it five days, just take it the five days. They're yes, already we they're all trying, want to minimize. They're trying to minimize exactly. Yeah. I know that uh, people do that properly with their animals. Yeah. But they don't do it properly with themselves. We take better care of our dogs and cats than we do for ourselves. Seriously, yeah, because yeah. we do um, in the compounding lab so many uh, pet prescriptions. And yeah, you, you see better um, compliance sometimes yeah. with the pet stuff. And nothing wrong with that, but you should, you know, it's just you a should shame take care not. of yourself like you are someone you are responsible for caring for. Yep. All right. Well, moving on here. Uh, Lots of articles about exercise and lifespan. This was fascinating to me. Um, CNN, Sandy Lamott reporting, look to exercise to extend life even for the oldest, study says. While both aerobic and weight training have enormous life improving and extending benefits, doing both has the biggest impact. The article says, uh, quote, this is from Dr. Bryant Weber, who did some of this research. We found that each type of physical activity was independently associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality in older adults, 65 plus. 
those who met the muscle strengthening guidelines only, so people that were only doing weight training or, or resistance training versus neither, had a 10% lower risk of mortality. And those who met the aerobic guidance only had a 24% lower risk of mortality. But those who met both guidelines had a 30% lower risk, he said. People who were 85 plus and older who met both the aerobic and muscle strengthening guidelines had a 28% lower risk of dying from any cause hmm. than people over 85 who met neither of those guidelines, the studies found. Which, hmm. and that was from a, a, a study uh, published in JAMA. And then this was a separate article from a separate study. This, stu this study was the one that it's going to reference is from the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, and these articles came out within a couple of weeks of each other. Combining weight training and other activity could lower your risk of early death, study finds. This is from Kristen Rogers. It says, older adults who did weight training with any aerobic activity reduce the risk of their early death from any cause up to 22%, a percentage that depended on the number of times they lifted weights within a week. Using weights once or twice weekly was associated with a 14% lower risk, and the benefit increased the more times someone lifted weights. Those who did aerobic exercise lowered their risk by up to 34% compared with patients who didn't do any weight training or aerobic exercise. But the lowest risk, 41 to 47% was among those who met recommended weekly amounts of aerobic activity and lifted weights once or twice per week compared with those who were doing neither. The authors didn't find a lower risk of death from cancer. So Shockingly, lifting weights will not stop you from getting cancer, but uh, everything else, it sounds like this is a great way to extend your life. And the fact that it's, they were specifically researching 65 plus, 85 plus, that means now is the right time to start. Yeah, the, uh, the JAMA study, I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, I mean, we, we have talked about the physical activity guidelines and different settings. And so I like that, in these studies, they were used as a reference point and used as like, hey, if these people are, you know, exercising two days a week or they're exercising beyond 150, you know, 150 minutes a week, which the guidelines suggest. Right. I just like that it, you know, crystallizes a little bit more of those recommendations. Um, the big data points that stuck out would be how few people were actually meeting the guidelines. Oh. So... In the cohort that they looked at, which all of these individuals are, they are over 65. I think over 50% were women. But still, it's still generally a decent snapshot of the general population. So of these, let's just say 115,000 people, 65 and older, over 72,000 people met, nearly, met neither guideline. And so that's 60, that's over 60%. Wow. So over 60% of the people didn't meet, you know, they didn't meet either the aerobic or, or the weight muscle. training. Yeah. Yeah. And so we know that we, we kind of had a feel for that already. Yeah. And then the other part of that is just over 11,000 people met both guidelines. And so that's less than 10%. Yeah. So seems like we're sort of just repeating ourselves and those in the space are just repeating themselves that exercise can help you live longer. It can help you do X and Y. It can help this and that, you know, yeah. we, I, I hate to feel like we're just, you know, a broken record, Yeah, but it's still, it's still important to but make that, make that, you know, sort of, um, observation, even if we can get that, that number from less than 10% to 15%, sure. To 20% to 30%. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and to see it in so many different ways too. That's why it may be the end, the end message or result is the same, but seeing it, the more you see it and this, the different ways you see the pie sliced, I think make, do mm -hmm. make a big difference. That's what sure. I was thinking. You're a broken yeah. record because every new study that comes out, the study didn't come out and say, you get a 2% chance of living longer if you exercise. Mm -hmm. Like there are substantial increases and it works for everyone across the board at any age. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's why you're a broken record. Yeah. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And it's also we we can make these points without saying that it's easy to meet the guidelines. I, I think that that should be clear as well. Nobody's saying that it's easy to do it. It's easy to set your alarm at five thirty and get your, you know, start your 150 minutes a week on Monday. Right. No one's saying any of that's easy. 
and there and, and quite frankly you know when i when i look at these numbers and what's what's required and i compare it to what i'm currently doing it it's you have to kind of work your butt off yeah you know it's in and, and that's also kind of distinguished in the definitions that the guidelines pose exercise is a form of physical activity but just physical activity is not doesn't necessarily mean exercise so it means that whenever you go do something if it is gardening at a little more higher intensity or it right. is walking at a higher intensity it has to be deliberate exercise so just moving around doing stuff in the kitchen even though it is movement it's not that time set aside yeah and so it has to be deliberate and the point is it's it is hard hmm. to it's hard to squeeze that in you gotta it make is. it a priority it is you know time needs carved out yeah but theoretically, at 65 plus, 85 plus, hopefully you have some time on your hands. Sure. And this is a thing you can you can do. Man. Definitely motivation to start earlier too. Great point. Mm -hmm. Whenever yes. you see that it is hard to hit those guidelines because, you know, I assume a lot of these people are starting, you know, they're starting time. Mm -hmm. so. so Dante, if you had your druthers, <laughs> granny would be swole. She'd be jacked, <laughs> right? Yep. I mean, is that what we're talking about? We're talking about lifting weights, like mm -hmm. trying to put on muscle? Yeah. I, I do love that question. Should should granny get swole? <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I do love when it. I saw that in here, yeah, I was laughing. I think that, and not to, I don't want to cut up on the question, but I think, right. I think this is an, an important sort of point to bring about. It implies that people are worried about getting too swole. <laughs> like, oh man, if I start yeah. if I start lifting, I'm there's a chance I might mess around and get too big. Yeah. Like yeah. that that's I I got I sense that when I talk to certain people, certain <laughs> demographics, and I'm like kind of asking myself, and I did steal a little bit of this from the guys at Barbell Medicine. They they sort of frame it this way. But it's like I have been working out my whole life to get too swole. And I don't think that I'm too swole. So I don't think that granny in this case <laughs> right. has to worry. Right. So I know that's a little humor, humorous, but, right. but think about that. Yes. You would have to be a hyper responder to exercise to be 65 plus and worry about, hmm, I think I might be swole. Yeah. Like to, yeah. A, to a detriment, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, should Granny get swole? Absolutely. And and what does that and what does that look like? You know, that doesn't necessarily mean joining a CrossFit gym. It doesn't necessarily mean joining a powerlifting gym. That doesn't necessarily mean buying a power rack for your garage. Right. But what it does mean is either using your body for resistance, so you know, some sort of pushing or pulling against your own body weight, climbing or crawling or whatever whatever it is to to create some form of resistance elastic bands that you can purchase for relatively you know inex relatively inexpensively um all sorts hand weights whatever whatever the case you can you can start with all of those things and i even know i do know that even some of those recommendations can feel a bit nebulous so it's like i bought the red band the green band the blue band now what the heck do i yeah, do yeah yeah it, it is hard but the point is just get those things. Yeah. Right? Make sure they're in your kitchen or in your family room or in your garage so that you feel tempted to pick them up. Yeah, if you're gonna be watching TV, you might yeah. as well learn a couple of exercises as well and, and do those while you're watching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Anything I, is better than nothing. Exactly. And, the, and up until this point, you know, a lot of the, the emphasis and a lot of the reasoning behind why you should resistance train, let's just say, was, was to make, you know, individuals that are 65 and older to give them more independence. So less, less, basically just less fall risk, right. which is huge. And that's still a huge point of why you would wanna work on balance training, muscle strengthening, flexibility, all of that stuff will help. But just to go back to these studies, the fact that they, they decrease your all cause mortality right. from lifting weights, really? Yes. I mean, that, that's a big thing. So we're, we're talking independence and extending out your lifespan. I mean, those are two, those are two big distinctions. Living yeah. longer, better. That's, Lo that's yes. what we want. Yeah, that's yes. an incredible combo. That's awesome. Um, the fact that it doesn't affect cancer mortality, I thought that was kind of humorously tacked in there. I, is that not a given? Yeah, um, I would have to, I, honestly, I didn't dive super deeply into that part of it. Sure. Because my, the last that I read the 
physical activity guidelines, they do highlight different cancers that you will have a lower risk. Interesting. Essentially of, you know, maybe getting. Yeah. So I would take that with a grain of salt. I don't think that anybody's saying that lifting weights or doing resistance bands is gonna like decrease the size of a tumor you have or something. Right, no, that is not gonna happen. But I know for a fact that it, it can decrease the likelihood of breast cancer, let's say. Really? Or, yes. Okay. And, and bladder cancers. And there, there are certain cancers that there's some sort of link. Especially Interesting. There's maybe but, there's a hormone link. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Especially, and especially more of like a, exactly like a downline sort of thing. So, yeah. so let's just say you're obviously exercising to maintain a healthy weight. If you're at a healthy weight, you're less likely to maybe contract one of the cancers that are more associated with increased adiposity or whatever. Wow. So, so there's, it's, we can look at this in a vacuum. Right. And we can look at all cause mortality. Like we can look at those things. But even though it's not decreasing tumor size or doing different right. things like that, it, yes, it's, yeah. it's not like preventing all nebulous cancers, let's just say. Very cool. So, so, so the big takeaway from this is start moving. <clears throat> yeah, as always. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Run, jump, climb trees, pick up heavy things mm -hmm. and do it on purpose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Start, yeah, and starting early is, yeah. starting now, starting early, you know, all huge parts of it. I love it. I love it. Well, all of our products are available on our website, askjoetomadio.com. That site is also where you can sign up for our mailing list, which is the best way to know when things are on sale. Find past episodes of this show. Find classic episodes of the radio show that started it all, Ask Joe Matteo. And if you have a question, you can email us, questions at askjoedematteo.com. Uh, show notes will be, articles will be referenced, uh, that we referenced will be in the description if you are looking for the specifics. And if you are listening only, then you're missing half the fun. You can't see the faces that Dante's making at me. Every episode is available as video too. Just go to YouTube or Rumble and look for Generation Health. Big thanks to Josiah Schweinberg Schwein. <laughs> for wow. running the cameras, making us look good. Michael Deppish for editing. Joyce Gibbs, our nurse. Joyce Gibb, our nurse practitioner, uh, who does private consultations. Diane Silverman, who manages our products. Terry, who handles scheduling. Cecilia, who handles dis handles distribution. Joey DiMatteo, Dante DiMatteo. I'm Tyler Andrews, and that's it for us this week. But now it is your turn. What are you going to do with what you have learned? Are you just listening? Or are you going to go take action and be, become part of this generation, Generation Health? 